I hung up the phone with her. She tried sending me text messages over the next few days, but I simply erased them. There were even a couple of voicemails, which I deleted after hearing the first few sentences. It was all the same. It was only my ex-wife's words and my daughter's voice. She made her decision ten years ago and could live with it. The so-called olive branch was nothing more than an insult. She could push the entire olive tree up her ear. So, I'm Tom Williams. I used to be married to Carl Williams. We'd been married for about 17 years when things broke apart. Of course, I was blamed for it. That is what innocent people go through in our lovely divorce courts in this nation. Blame the dad. Then give the ex-wife full custody so she can tell the kids how bad their father is. I swear the divorce laws in our nation were written by a group of man-hating furniture southerners to avoid anyone with a deck. As I mentioned, we had been married for 17 years. We had two children, a 14-year-old son and a 16-year-old daughter. I thought things was going okay. I adored my wife and I was confident that she loved me. Our kids were clever, athletic, well-adjusted and attractive. Curly was a daddy's girl, whereas Josh was a pleasant and athletic guy. I was making a decent living as a mechanical engineer, and Kayla was doing well as an accountant. We both worked hard to stay in shape and looked very decent. As previously said, Carly was a daddy's girl through and through. She seemed to adore me, and I was wrapped around her little finger. She seemed to be strong at math and science, so she chose to become an engineer like her father. She received her driver's license the day she turned 16. She, like myself, has loved driving since she was 10 years old. She would be out in the garage handing me wrenches as I worked on the many toys I had acquired. I'm an unapologetic gearhead. I enjoy all cars, particularly GM ones that I can tinker with and build up. She has cultivated my affection for them as well. Some weekends we'd go to auto shows and spend the day fawning over those amazing cars. We seemed to be practically inseparable almost every weekend. I was also rather skilled with home improvement projects. Carly was always eager to assist me with any home improvement projects. I taught basic plumbing, electrical, drywall, and painting. She was right there with me as I fitted new appliances. She even helped me install a new concrete slab near my shop. Well, Carly would go to her mother about feminine matters, which made me extremely happy. She would come to me for advice and help with everything else, including homework, drama with her friends, guidance on things she was considering doing, boyfriends, and so on. We were quite open and honest with one another. When she got into trouble, it was my phone. She called for assistance. I had a daddy's girl, whereas Kayla had a mama's boy. Josh was never as interested in vehicles and mechanics as his older sister was. He was an excellent student, but science was not his strong suit. Very exciting. He excelled at English literature and civics. He started discussing becoming a lawyer. Sure, Josh and I spent time together, but he seemed to be closer to his mother than I was. Killers seems to be a little off for the past few weeks. There was nothing overt, but she appeared distant and would occasionally zone out for a minute or two. I asked her a few of times recently if everything was okay, but she just blew me off and dismissed my concern. I usually appreciated it when she blew me off, but this wasn't one of those times. Again... Nothing overt, but something seems odd. It was Friday evening. I'd just come home from work. It was 6 p.m., which was my regular time to arrive home on a Friday evening. I noticed the killer was already at home, as usual. I walked in the door and announced that I was home as usual. There were no odors of dinner cooking, which was unusual. Also, Carly did not come down to greet me. Even though she's a teenager now, she regularly greets me. She's at home. She and Josh must still be hanging out with buddies. I left my briefcase at my office and walked upstairs to change into more comfortable attire for the evening. When I walked into the bedroom, I noticed that my wife had laid out her LBD seductive underwear, stockings and garters, as well as her six-inch boots, which explained the lack of sense at dinner. We obviously planned to go out tonight instead. I wish she had informed me beforehand, but I had no other arrangements. When I walked in, Killer was still in the bathroom putting her makeup. Where do we go, sweetheart? I inquired as I began to remove my dress shirt. Are we going anywhere? She responded. That seemed weird. So if we're not going somewhere, why are you getting all made up and laying out a lovely outfit on the bed? I said we were heading out. I am. Really? And where do you think you're going? Just like that. Without me. Also, where are the children? I got a nasty feeling about it. 
The children are spending the night with friends. I'm not sure where my date will take me, but I'll most likely be home sometime tomorrow morning. What? You're on a date and won't be back until the morning? Exactly what I said. I'm going on a date tonight, and if everything goes as planned, I'll spend the night with him. She said, Call me the duck. You are what the duck makes you believe for a moment that I will put up with the duck. You want to go out in your round. You can wait for the duckling divorce to be finalized. Stop being foolish. There will be no divorce. I'm only going to do this once. Then everything will return to normal. I need this night. We've been married for 17 years, and I just need to go out once to show to myself that I'm still appealing to other men. If you truly love me, you will allow me to have this night and it won't even register on the radar. If you truly love me, you would not even consider doing this. I love you, but I need it. I'm getting older, and I need to believe that I'm still attractive to other men, especially younger males. Clarence is around ten years younger than myself. He'd been flirting with me for the past six months, and I finally decided to accept his offer. It only takes one night of sex to prove to myself that I am still a lovely woman that attracts other men. This is simply a confidence boost for me. I've noticed a few lines and a couple of gray hairs growing in. I want to improve my ego. I don't need this, and I will not put up with it. Do you remember the part of the wedding vows about abandoning all others? You do this. You are breaking your vows. Do not be silly. This is just for one night. After I return home, I will never do it again. I promise. Are you stupid or do you think I'm stupid? After violating your commitment to me in front of God, family, and friends, do you honestly expect I would ever believe a simple promise you made in private? Simply, simply, if you follow through on this, we are done. You walk out that door, and I'll consult with a lawyer as soon as possible. Do not be an idiot. There will be no divorce. I will return home and be the lovely, dedicated wife that I have always been. If you try to divorce me, I will fight for as long and as hard as I can. You will lose the house and most of your possessions while I will gain full custody of the children. Furthermore, I will do everything in my power to disrupt your visits, and I will blame you solely for the family's dissolution. I will make sure that your children hate you. I was taken aback by the phrases you used to declare you loved me. You'd do all that to me. Damn right I would. I love you. But if you try to divorce me... I will fight you over it. I don't want to lose you. So I'm merely delivering the consequences of your deeds. Look, I told you I only needed one night to prove that I was still appealing and sexy. Yeah, so what happens in a few more years? What about the next time you realize you're getting older and wonder if you can still attract a younger man? Let me guess. He has a large clock, and the talk at the water cooler suggests that he is an excellent lover. I bet he's hit practically every slut you've worked with. I promise that will not happen. And yeah, I have overheard some rumors. I admit I am curious, but it will only be sex. There will be no love involved. You have nothing to worry if he takes me away from you. As I already stated, this is just a one-time thing to get it off my chest. Maybe I'll even learn something that will make your sex life more enjoyable. A few new tricks will spice up our lovemaking. If you go through with this, I've already informed you what the consequences will be. If you call him right away and cancel, we may go through marriage counseling and try to save our marriage. Do not be dumb. We are going to be all right. If you truly insist on counseling to mend your Bruce Little ego, we may discuss it when I return tomorrow. With that, she began to prepare for her date. I changed into pants and a t-shirt before leaving the room. She was downstairs a short time later, dressed in the clothing she had laid out. She was holding a small clutch and checking herself in the mirror near the door. I was sitting in my recliner in the living room. I heard a hug coming from the automobile outside. He's here. I have to go. I will see you in the morning, she said as she approached to kiss me farewell. I moved my head and leaned away from her. She ended up kissing the air. She stood back up and frowned at me from five feet away. Everything will return to normal once you have recovered from your little hissy fit. With that... She turned and walked for the door. I made one final plea. If you walk out that door, we are finished. You should seriously consider whether it is worth throwing away 17 years of marriage. She turned back to face me. I am not throwing anything away. As I already stated, I will return and everything will resume normal operations. With that, she opened the door and walked out. Yes, 
I began to grieve over the loss of my marriage and the lady I had loved solely for the last 20 years. 17 years of marriage. When you've been engaged for two years and are dating exclusively. I didn't understand how she could do this to me. She had never expressed disapproval to me. We had a good sex life, and she never expressed wanting more. If we hadn't been arguing about something, I would have cheerfully given her more. Sure, there were some problems, but like with other couples, we talked them and reached an agreement. I had decided what I would do if she followed through with it. After a half hour, I got up and went to work. I guess I waited half an hour for her to come to her wits and return. Obviously, that was not occurring. I walked upstairs and started my strategy. It wasn't much of a plan, but it was the best I could muster at the moment. It was a very large four-bedroom house with a master bedroom, Curly's room, Josh's room, and a spacious guest bedroom. The guest bedroom was essentially a second master bedroom with its own bathroom. We could use it any time either she or my family visited. We would also utilize it for the children's sleepovers. Now that would be my temporary bedroom. It took me about two hours to move out of our old bedroom and into my new one. I had no illusions about what would happen in our divorce. This was a fault-free state. That suggests that the divorce laws in this state were written by feminist accounts that despise men. Basically, unless the wife was convicted of a major felony and sentenced to at least 10 years in prison, the husband was out. It didn't matter whether the husband was an innocent victim, the wife would get the house, kids would receive child support maintenance, which was previously known as alimony, and the husband would be responsible for all bills. She gets the gold mine while he gets the shaft. After settling into my new temporary living quarters, I went to my home office and logged on to her internet banking. I opened another account in my name a few years ago. It was not for any malicious purposes. I just wanted to buy her gifts and surprise her. We both had access to her finances, and there were a few occasions when she went to check on ours and noticed a purchase I had made for her. Needless to say, her birthday and Christmas gifts were not particularly surprising. As a result, I opened a new account in my name solely for the purpose of purchasing her presents while keeping her unaware of what she was receiving in advance. I've decided to repurpose that account now. She was aware of it, but had no access to it. First, I transferred exactly half of her checking and savings accounts to my personal account. Next, I used the remaining funds in the joint account to pay off and cancel all of our credit cards. I then applied for a few new cards in my name alone. Yes. I should have paid everything off before transferring any funds, but I decided it was better to repay whatever a court ordered than to try to collect anything from her. On Monday morning, when I arrived at work, I would transfer my direct deposit from work to my personal account. I'd also have to call our broker and have our investment split on Monday. After finishing what I could, I took another tumbler of gin beam on the rocks and went up to my room for the night. I finished my drink as I prepared for bed. It was not a restful night's sleep. First and foremost, I had gotten used to sleeping next to my wife. The bed appeared empty without her. Then my mind simply refused to shut off. I kept thinking about what I could have done to prevent this. Should I have tried to stop her from going out the door? She was physically restrained and escorted out to the car with a baseball bat. A gun and going to jail. It's been worth it. The night was long. I did those on and off intermittently, but not much. I finally decided to get up as light began to come through the window. I was still tired, so I decided to shower more than anything else in order to fully wake up. After shaving, showering, and brushing my teeth, I dressed in jeans and a t-shirt and headed downstairs. I eat breakfast and have a couple cups of coffee while reading the newspaper. It was 9 a.m. when Killer Wolves returned to the house. I was in my office using the computer to look at apartments for rent. I had already looked into lawyers and scheduled an appointment for Monday afternoon through their online scheduling. Good morning, honey. I'm home, just as I promised, she cheerfully greeted as she walked into the house. I simply ignored her throughout the night, and this morning my rage grew over what she had done. This morning, as I drank my coffee, I realized that I had done nothing to deserve her disrespect. I also realized there was nothing I could have done to stop what she did. This was entirely on her. Even if I had stopped her last night, she would have done it again. Many people believe that you cannot stop loving someone suddenly. Perhaps they're right. What you can do is convert that love into hatred. The opposite of love is not hatred. It's indifference. 
hatred is still an emotional response. Marriage counselors frequently create marriages by transforming hatred into love. If there is indifference, there is no way that all of my love for my wife yesterday before I arrived home has been channeled into hatred. It was incredibly simple to do. All I needed to do was focus on her lack of respect for me. I then added her threats against me if I didn't comply. Her dismissive attitude toward my feelings exacerbated the situation. I had several hours to concentrate on all of that. Honey, where are you? I'm home. Just as I promised, I cleaned up before coming home for you, honey. I heard her calling out as she walked around the house looking for me. There you are, she said, opening the door to my office. I am back, and now everything can return to normal. She continued as she approached my desk. She moved around the desk, reaching out her arms to hug and kiss me. I shoved her backward. Keep your filthy disease lips separate from the nasty slut. God only knows what they touched or what nasty shit was in your mouth. Her eyes widened in shock. I had never spoken to her like that in all the years we had known each other. I continued before she could respond. You should go to the clinic and have a full battery of tests done. I'd like to see another ice clean report from you before you make any more filthy calls on me. In terms of sex, I wouldn't touch your disease readings with a ten-foot pole. Even if I put a dozen condoms on top, it probably wouldn't matter. Nope. Her facial expression changed from shock to anger. I was hoping for her to realize what she had done and feel remorse. I see you're still dealing with your bruised ego. I'm going up to a room to take a nap. I had a long night and need to rest for a while. I hope you've calmed down and we can talk later. I expect a complete apology for your rudeness this morning. She turned and stormed out of the room. I couldn't help but smile, anticipating a faster turn. I wasn't to be disappointed. What the fuck were you doing? I heard a scream as she charged back. Where were your clothes? With all of your toiletries. What the fuck were you doing? She shouted as she stormed back into my office. What do you mean? I asked calmly. Everything I own is exactly where it should be. What exactly are you talking about? Your closet is empty. Your drawers are empty. Your vanity area is currently empty. What do you mean? That everything is where it should be. As previously said, my clothes are carefully hung in my closet, folded and stored in my dresser, and my toiletries are neatly arranged in my bathroom. They are not. I simply told you that your belongings are not in our bedroom, she exclaimed in frustration. Now I understand your difficulty. You see, you're still thinking of your bedroom as ours. I just informed you that everything I own is where it should be. In my bedroom. What do you mean? Yes, I told you I wouldn't put up with it. So I moved out of your bedroom. I'll be sitting in my new bedroom until I can locate an apartment and move. I considered telling her about her finances. The ducat allowed her to find out on her own. Furthermore, there's no need in spoiling the surprise before I can take care of the investments. Her eyes narrowed with annoyance. We shall talk about this later. I'll give you a week to recover from your little fit. Then I expect you to return everything and we'll be back to normal. Not until I have a notarized report declaring that you are free of all diseases. I shot back, returning my concentration to the computer. I spent much of the day in my office. The kids arrived home early in the afternoon. I quickly wondered how long it would take them to realize there was an issue. I discovered a couple apartments that seemed good, so I filled out the papers and made appointments to see them on Tuesday. I then printed our financial statements. I'd need that for the lawyer on Monday. Well, I had no illusions about selling the house. I felt getting a value on it would help with the settlement. In theory, she would be worth half the equity. Wishful thinking. Still, I spent the rest of the day researching our state's divorce rules. I knew I was going to be screwed over, but at least I'd have a sense of how awful it was, which would help me plan, if nothing else. Daddy, Carly murmured. Dinner is ready, as she peered through the door. Okay, sweetheart, thank you. When I entered the kitchen, Killer smiled warmly. The strategy was obvious. Kill me with kindness and show me what I would lose if I didn't accept what she had done. She'd gone all out. She had dressed up and applied her makeup. Her hair was done in the style I preferred. She had spent quite some time in the kitchen that afternoon preparing my favorite dish. I entered the kitchen. She walked over and brought me a glass of wine. I poured you a glass of wine she explained as she handed it to me and moved in for a kiss. I noticed the hurt in her eyes as I leaned away from her. I grabbed the glass from her, walked over to the sink, poured it out and placed it on the counter. 
I then took the tumbler out of the cabinet, placed some ice in it, and poured a couple of fingers of gin into it. There was no chance the youngsters at the table didn't notice the movement over to the table. I sat down and started conversing with the children. I never recognized my wife. Dinner was clearly tense. I kept up as many interactions with the kids as possible, but it was clear that there were severe issues. It didn't help that I never placed anything on my plate, let alone eat it. These were my favorite dishes, but I simply passed the bowls and platters along without looking at them. I just keep trying to talk to my kids after saying to my drink, Dad, aren't you going to eat anything? Josh eventually asked. No, not hungry. That was all, I responded, after the most embarrassing meal in history. I simply got up, refilled my glass, and returned to my office. I didn't even try to help clean the table. Approximately half an hour later, I turned off the computer, got the keys to my truck, and left the house to go to a nice, peaceful restaurant for supper. After that, I went to the bar to have a few drinks. It was late when I came home. I noticed that the light in Kelly's bedroom was still on, so I made sure that when I closed the door to my room, it made enough noise for her to hear. I closed the door and moved a chair underneath the knob while I prepared for bed. I heard you attempted to knock the knock. She attempted to get me to open the door for almost five minutes before giving up. I was awake early the next morning. I determined that today would be football day. There were three games in the morning, midday, and evening, and I watched them all. Yes, there were weekend duties to complete, but I chose to neglect them. Tucker, I wouldn't be living here for much longer so Kayla could simply hire someone else to do it. I've already finished the most of the pot of coffee and begun preparing to cook omelets for breakfast. I had already finished mine when Carly walked into the kitchen. Hello, sweetheart. Omelet, I asked. Sure, Dad. Thanks. She got her drink and sat at the table as I started cooking her meal. A few minutes later, Josh appeared. I promised him I'd make it as soon as I finished with his sisters. Carly was eating her omelet as I was cooking Josh's, and I heard Kale in the hallway. So I poured the final cup of coffee into my cup and switched off the pop. She shuffled in, grabbed a cup from the cabinet, and peered at the empty pot. You could not even leave the cup for me. She scowled at me. Pots are right there. You understand how to make it. Whatever. So you're making this thing? I just finished making them. But feel free to make one for yourself, I said as I slipped Josh's on his plate. I used the last of what I've made for him. I had already put all of the ingredients away. Tucker, after taking care of the children, I exited the kitchen. It was shortly before midday. I was in the living room watching the morning game. Killer walked in with a plate and a bottle of beer. She placed it on the coffee table in front of me. I brought you some food and a beer so you wouldn't miss any of the game, she said pleasantly, without even glancing at her. I took my foot and slid, both of which they played off the table and onto the floor. She just sat there, mouth open, shocked. A commercial just came on, so I stood up and went into the kitchen to get myself a beer. Yes, I hear all of you out there whining about alcohol misuse after spilling a full drink on the floor. I was not going to drink anything she brought me, so it would have been a waste anyhow. No, I did not clean up the mess. She brought it in unexpectedly so that she could clean it up herself. I didn't mind if it stained the carpet. I wasn't going to be living there for much longer. We need to talk about this, Kale began. Dickinson, shut up, I responded. For God's sake, change your attitude. The children have already noticed. It's bound to happen. I'm sure they'll notice after I move out. Get over yourself. You are not moving out and there will be no divorce. She insisted on starting the way things started later in the day. At least they were considerate enough to wait until halftime. Carly and Josh entered the room together. They sat on the couch rather aggressively. Dad, what is going on between you and Mom? Carly began. You may as well know now. Your mother and I are getting divorced. This has absolutely nothing to do with either of you. We both love you. This is only between your mother and me. Josh, this is the way. Your mother did something I simply cannot tolerate, even after I expressed my thoughts about it. But she still did it. She showed no remorse for it. You mean when she went out with her date on Friday night? Carly asked. Do you know about that? I was really astonished. Okay, yeah, Mom informed us you were unhappy about it. So you know she cheated on me, right? No, she did not. She said she told you about it beforehand, therefore it wasn't cheating. 
She did not sneak behind your back to do it. That was the only time she'd ever done anything like that, Josh explained. Yes, Dad. Besides, it was only one night out of the twenty years you had been dating and married. She suggested that if you truly loved her, you would simply let her have that one night and go on. Carly said, I was honestly flabbergasted. It also hurt that my daddy's girl didn't even care to grasp my situation. She had taken her mother's side and refused to listen to my point of view. Really? What if she actually loved me? She would not consider having sex with anyone else. Come on, Dad. It was only one time and she pledged never to do it again. Okay, let's talk about her pledges. A little more than 17 years ago, she made a solemn promise to me. She made a pledge before God. Our family and friends. She vowed to abandon all others. There were no exceptions in that commitment. That promise was only valid until death do us part. In case you didn't notice, neither of us has died. She can easily break the solemn commitment she made in public. How can I possibly believe any promises she makes to me in private? Yeah, but you also promised to stand by her in good and terrible times. Josh had been contemplating about becoming a lawyer. I hope he gets much better at it than that. The difficulty is that your mother, by violating her commitment, violated the contract and released me from my obligations. We just don't see why you would split up the family over a single night, Carly asked. Why are you saying this? I am splitting up the family. Why am I being blamed for what she did? Mom is not leaving. She wants to put this behind us and go forward. You are the one who is leaving and making a huge deal out of things. If you leave, you will split up the family, Carly insisted. It did not get any better after that. I tried to clarify my stance, but they wouldn't listen. They were not even remotely interested in my opinion. Kill had spent the previous day stuffing their heads with her crap. All they understood was that Mommy did something she truly needed to do, and Daddy didn't love her or the kids enough to accept her requests. She persuaded them that Daddy's small male ego was forcing him to abandon everyone and disband the family. It was Daddy's fault because he couldn't provide Mommy with even the smallest of necessities for her happiness. Instead, Daddy was determined to make everyone suffer for his small-minded stubbornness. It was only one night out of their 20 years together. Seriously, what is one night out of 7,305 nights, 20 years, or 365 days per year, plus one extra day every five leap years? They ultimately rushed away when it was clear that I would not accept their position. As the game came to a finish, I was able to watch the rest of it peacefully. I began to smell the smells of dinner being made. It was clearly another one of my favorites. I just sat there and watched the after-game show as I waited for the next game. It was the peak of the hour. Kickoff would take 20 minutes. Josh came in to let me know that dinner was ready. I simply stood up, took the keys to my truck, and began walking towards the door. Where are you going? Dinner is being laid on the table, Josh asked. I'm heading down to the sports bar to watch the game. There's at least something there, I responded. But mom, repair. I will come back after the game. I might hang out for a while once it's over. I hung out after the game. They had a delicious burger with seasoned fries. The beer was also fairly good. I just had approximately one beer every quarter, so I was still safe to drive. Besides, it was only around five minutes from home. By the time I arrived home, everyone had gone to bed, so I went to my bedroom, locked and bolted the door, and fell asleep. When I arrived home, the dish and bottle on the coffee table had been cleaned up. That made me smile. Monday morning, I got up early and left the house before anyone else did. The first thing I did when I arrived at the workplace was phone my broker. I mentioned that I was getting a divorce and that I required him to split all of our investments evenly. He opened a new account in my name and transferred half of our investments into it. Next up, HR. I removed his name from my retirement account and requested that Carly and Josh be added instead. I also gave them my new bank account information so they could redirect my paycheck there. Finally, I informed my supervisor that I was about to get divorced and would require some time off to meet with my lawyer, attend court dates, meetings, and so on. He was okay with it. My lawyer basically told me what I already knew. I needed to think, so I would get tucked. There was a slim chance that I may gain custody, but it was entirely contingent on where the children wanted to live. They were old enough for the court to seriously consider their preferences. Based on my conversation with them yesterday, I wasn't going to count on it. 
Basically, the only reason a guy would hire a lawyer for a divorce was so that the lawyer could add loot to their book before the book ducking. Otherwise, they'd be ducks without lubrication. I hadn't completed the paperwork yet and requested that he have her served at work on Monday. I didn't bother heading home immediately after work. It was Monday night football, so I simply drove over to the sports bar and threw tacos for a dollar. I had three in the first half, then three more in the second. I ignored Killer's texts and phone calls. I responded to Carly and told her where I was. Her reaction to that was not particularly pleasant. When I walked in after the game, all three of them handed me the UV light. I simply entered my office and closed the door. By the time I finished and walked up to my room, everyone had gone to bed. Tuesday morning, I got up early and left the house before anyone else did. Work was well, so I took the afternoon off to look at flats. I picked on a wonderful two-bedroom unit and paid the deposit. I should be able to move in on Saturday. I bought a couch, table, and chairs at a second-hand store. They were scheduled to be delivered on Saturday afternoon. I decided I'd like to gamble that I was using, so I'd take it along with everything else in my home office. When I arrived home, they were already eating dinner. I snickered when I realized they hadn't even placed a dish for me. That was okay with me. I wasn't going to eat it anyway. I simply walked to the refrigerator and took out the ingredients for a large sandwich. After finishing my lunch, I grabbed a bag of chips and a bottle and headed into my office. Jeez, Dad, why are you being such an asshole, co-worker yelled as she walked into my office. Okay, clearly. Simply put, your mother has cheated on me. She completely disrespected me. Then she tossed it at my face. I won't put up with it. I explained quite plainly what would happen if she went along with it. She went forward with it, even knowing what would happen. You can't seriously split up the family over that. Come on, it was nothing. It was only sex. Carly, one day you will be married. Consider how you would feel if your husband informed you one evening that he had a date with a younger, prettier lady and planned to spend the night with her. I'm sure I wouldn't enjoy it, but if you promised to come back to me and it was just a one-time thing, I'd like to think I'd love him enough to get over it. Furthermore, if he told me about it first, it wouldn't be considered cheating on her. Sure, do me a favor. When you get married, gaze directly into your groom's eyes while you read your vows and stare into his adoring eyes when you reach the line about abandoning all others. Imagine the adoration in those eyes turning to absolute anguish when you tell him you're heading out to avoid another man. With that, I turned my back on her and returned to work. Wednesday evening marked the ambush. When I returned home from work, both sets of parents were present. People sometimes make fun of their in-laws, but I got along really well with her parents. They had welcomed me into their family as if the son had never known Charles. Her father was a gearhead, just like me. His only issue was that he was into. Okay, so he had absolutely awful taste in cars, but I could overlook the fact that he had a perfect 1969 Mustang Fastback. Yes, my parents and I got along extremely well. We were not one of those dysfunctional families whose children grow up to despise their parents. They were always extremely kind and supportive of me. Yes, there were conflicts, and they were never afraid to tell me when they believed I was wrong about something. Sometimes we simply had to agree to disagree. So I entered the house and discovered the ambush had been set up. I was a little confused. I understood why her parents would be present. Obviously, they would side with her. She is their daughter, after all. What confused me was that my own parents were present. That would appear to be counterproductive for her. My parents would agree and support me. I example, if she was attempting to persuade me to tolerate her infidelity, why would she invite someone who wasn't on her side? Who would disagree that I was correct in divorcing her cheating ass? You've probably found out what took me a few more minutes to realize. Tom Charles initiated the intervention. I want you to know that this might kill his mother, and I'm terribly disappointed with what killed it. That being said, we believe you were overreacting to this. Yes, she went out and had sex with another man which was extremely insulting to you, especially the manner she did it. Still, it was only one error. You have been together for a total of 20 years. You have two amazing children together. Think about all of this. Surely you can get over this minor issue. You don't have to break up your family over a single error. A minor error. Serious. This was not a minor error. 
she didn't unintentionally stumble and end up with this dink accidentally sticking in her account. This was a premeditated event. They probably planned it. At least one week in advance. Then she ambushes me just an hour before she leaves, giving me no time to resist you. This was an intentional attempt to cheat on me, son. Mom decided to join the fray. She did not cheat on you. She informed you about it initially. What? First and foremost, you are correct that she told me. She told me she had never asked. She simply stated that she was doing it, and I had no say about it. Even when I raised serious objections, she didn't care. Speaking of telling, I did inform her that this would occur if she went ahead with it. Tom, my father tried. I understand your sadness and fury, but consider your family. We love you, son. We will be there to assist you heal. But think about what you'll do to your family. Kill still loves you, and she has said she will not do it again. We all believe that with counseling and some work, you can overcome this. It is not a good idea to break up your family. We raised you to be a good man. You need to step up and keep your family together. Don't do something stupid that will ruin your relationship with your family. Think about your mother and myself, too. These are our grandchildren, and we will do everything as necessary to maintain our relationship with them. I just sat there absolutely stunned. My folks were actually on her side. They were basically telling me to ignore her cheating on me. I couldn't take any more of it. I turned and walked out of the room into my bedroom. Killer attempted to follow me, but I closed the door in her face. Ten minutes later, I'd changed into jeans, a casual shirt, and boots. I never spoke a word. I strolled straight past the living room and out the front door. As I walked past, everyone was still sitting there trying to talk to me. I never acknowledged them. I simply strolled out the door, got into my pickup, and headed to the sports bar for supper and a few beers. Fortunately, the house was silent and dark when I returned around four hours later. Thursday and Friday were simply more of the same. I completely neglected Kayla and my children, who are still angry with me. I was amazed Kayla hadn't noticed that the credit cards were no longer working. I am confident that when she goes shopping on Saturday, she will figure it out. It was Friday evening. I'd been home for approximately an hour. I was at my office, checking over a few items and deciding what I would take tomorrow and what would come later. Killer opened the door and walked inside. She wore a translucent nightgown, stockings, a garter belt, and heels. I have to say, she looked great. Tonight, the kids will be spending the night somewhere. It's time for you to get over your folly and join me in bed. I want you to make love to me all night. I truly need you to take me back. I glanced at her for a moment. No thanks. Furthermore, I have yet to get a clinic report confirming your disease-free status. Stop being silly. I need you back in my bed. Your anger outburst is accomplishing nothing. Now come on, I'm horny and need sex. Not the least bit interested. Look, if you don't, I will have to contact Clarence again. So much for that being a one-time thing. But if you continue to reject me, you are pushing me back to someone else. Have fun. Let me know if you're bringing him here so I can leave the smoke that was coming out of her mouth and nose as she rushed out of the room. It took a few minutes to clear. About a half hour later, I heard the front door bang. She nearly burned out her tires as she sped down the street. I took advantage of an empty house to pack up a few items. I disassembled the bed and loaded it into the truck, along with most of my stuff. I planned to sleep on the sofa in my office tonight, after loading everything I needed into my truck. I placed a gym beam on the rocks and relaxed. The sofa. It wasn't the most comfy thing I've ever slept on, but it was fine. The next morning, I went to the leasing office and picked up the apartment key. It took me a while, but I eventually got everything out of the truck and into the apartment. Fortunately, a few of sympathetic neighbors helped. When I returned, no one was home, so I asked a neighbor's adolescent son to help me pack my desk. An office, furniture, my computer printer, and accessories were loaded into the cab. I returned to the living room and thought, Ducky, I'm taking the recliner, too. I'm guessing no one arrived home until that evening, or no one bothered to look into my office or the spare bedroom. I'm amazed they didn't notice the missing recliner, though. It was early evening when my phone rang. I responded, recognizing her as my daughter. Daddy, where are you? I'm at home, sweetheart. No, you are. Your offices were wiped out. The extra bedroom's bed and dresser are gone, and your recliner is no longer in the living room. Besides, I looked everywhere, and you were not there. Furthermore, the item you took is no longer available. You're correct. I am not there. I'm home. I don't live there anymore. I've moved into an apartment now. Maybe after the divorce is finalized, I'll get another house. 
but this will suffice for now. God, Dad, I can't believe you're being such an asshole about this. I thought you loved us. I love you, sweetheart. I always have and will, just not enough to keep us from abandonment. I am not abandoning you. You will still be able to see me whenever you want. I will still take care of you and your brother. You're abandoning us. You abandoned us and are tearing up our family. Your mother is the one who divided the family. I explained what would happen if she went out on that date. She did it anyway. But she believed you loved her enough to go past that. And I believed she loved me enough not to do it. Fine. Whatever. Then she hung up. Yeah. Divorce was a nightmare. She fought through it all. Counseling. She asked me to pay. I refused. I argued that if she wanted something, she should pay for it. That was one of the rare arguments that I won. Such a waste of time. The counselor did not like me much. I believe that had something to do with my informing him that I was ordered to attend. But the judge stated nothing about my real participation. I endured through all twelve sessions until the counselor gave up. She argued over almost everything. She totally disliked the worthless, funny poster in the garage. She suddenly found herself unable to live without it. I unintentionally left the Bud Light lamp in the workplace. She disliked it, but I'd had it on my desk since college. It became the focal point of her office redecoration plans. Yes, it was all BS. She was only doing this to make the divorce as difficult as possible for me at all times, making it difficult for me to perceive the children as she did. Finally, the judge approved the divorce. I had to continue paying half of the mortgage. She, of course, maintained the house for $2,000 each month. Child support. However, I did have visits on Wednesday evenings and every other weekend. What truly annoyed me was the $1,000 per month for five years of spousal maintenance. It would be null and void if she remarried during that time frame. I was not going to hold my breath. I discovered that she had moved clients in with her before the divorce was even finalized. So, yes, half of my paycheck went to her. I cashed out part of my savings and purchased a modest property in desperate need of repairs. At the very least, I was able to preserve it on a one-fourth acre lot. Thankfully, I was able to smuggle all of my tools out of the garage the week after I moved out. I refused to address them. I had most of them before we met. When she pressed, I began raving about her jewelry, beautiful clothes and shoes. The home had electricity, gas, and running water. The roof was on top and the walls were standing. That was good enough for me. I moved in and started working on it throughout the evenings and weekends. Visitation? Yeah, I was meant to have visitation. I also did it a few times. It was a fucking disaster until they did everything they could to prevent it. The youngsters were busy. They went on a weekend outing with their friends. It's funny how that always happened on my weekends, but not hers. Killer needs to practice on Wednesday. Josh has a big test on Thursday and needs to study during my few Wednesday evening visits. The children were hostile toward me. Even after explaining my point of view, they continue to blame me for everything. When the opposition has them, there is almost always a captive audience, and I only have an hour or two. Occasionally. It is a losing battle. After the third time, they flatly stated that they did not want to see me again. Sure, I could have forced it, but what's the point? Forcing them to see me would have exacerbated their resentment. I send them gifts, cards, and letters on their birthdays and at Christmas. They were all returned unopened. I continue to send out my monthly checks. I saw they were cashed, but I never heard the term graduation. I assume they graduated, but I haven't heard anything about it. I sent them a registered letter informing them about the college funds I had set up for them. I did receive feedback on that. No thanks. Killer had effectively poisoned my children against me, just as she had promised. I focused solely on housework. I go out and do anything. It's incredible how much money you can save by doing this. As if all this wasn't bad enough. Hello, Mom, I said as she answered the phone. Tom, how are you? She replied cheerfully, performing as well as can be expected. Anyway, I have not heard anything about Thanksgiving. Will you host it again this year? There was silence on the other end. Mom, are you still there? I asked. So this is a little awkward. You? Yes, we are the killers of parents. The kids are coming over for it. She's also bringing her new man with her. We all thought having you here would be too awkward for everyone. After all, the children are still angry at you for abandoning them. And having you here with Kayla and her new man would make things too tense. Seriously, Mom, you're inviting my ex-wife and her boyfriend rather than your own son to Thanksgiving. 
We want to maintain a close relationship with our grandchildren. Besides, it's your fault. You should work to keep your family together rather than breaking it up. How about coming over on Christmas Eve? Your father and I will be spending Christmas Day at a killer's house, but we can celebrate with you the day before. Whatever I mumbled was meant for you to call. I spent Christmas Eve at home watching Die Hard and ignoring my mother's multiple calls and text messages, wondering where I was. I wasn't in the holiday spirit, I just said this to the packages I sent to my children a week ago. They were returned to my doorstep yesterday. I received a wedding announcement after five years. Kyle married Clarence the weekend after my last maintenance payment, which coincided with Josh's 18th birthday a year earlier, so I was already finished with child support. Now I was completely free of my former family and my obligations to them. I celebrated by drinking. Yeah, I'm not really proud of that. But duck it. I had worked my ass off and given them all of my love only to be rejected and treated like a sheep dutton. Now that I'd fulfilled all of my obligations to the witch and her two grateful offspring, I decided to put them out of my mind as much as possible. They obviously had no relationship with me so I would forget about them as much as possible and move on. Except for one thing, which has always bugged me. I had to continue paying half of the mortgage on the house. Sure, it ended when Josh graduated from high school, but my name remained on the deed. I believe Kayla had the mistaken impression that the house was hers, free and clear. The divorce only stated that she could live there until the children graduated from high school. Now all bets are off. I had the right to half of the assets, which were quite large. Update. I first contacted my lawyer when we divorced. The house was appraised for around $300,000 with approximately $200,000 in equity. That happened five years ago. Since then, we've been making on-time mortgage payments, and property values in our area have increased significantly, according to online research. I estimated that the appraised value was now around $500,000, with equity in the range of $450,000. Yes, we only had $50,000 remaining on the note. Why did I do this? Obviously, we couldn't use an extra quarter million dollars. Aside from that, it would completely piss them off. She loved that house, and having to give me a penny for anything because it made her go crazy, and I was looking for any kind of retaliation for what she had done. This will also repay me for all of the maintenance and mortgage payments I had to make for her. The call arrived about a week later. Tom, what the hell is going on? Well, Taylor, there isn't much happening here. I'm just working on fixing up the house I bought. What's up with you? I have to admit my surprise if you are calling to see how I am doing. After all, this is the first time you've spoken to me since the divorce, you asshole. I'm not calling to ask how you're doing. I'm calling to find out why a realtor came to my house to look at it and get my signature on the listing contract. That. It should be pretty self-explanatory given that both of our names appear on the title. She would obviously need your signature to complete the sale. Would there be a sale? I adore this house and I am not about to sell it. When can I expect to receive the check for my half of the equity? Nice try. I received the house in the divorce. No, you only had use of the house until Josh graduated from high school. This happened last month. Now we can either sell it and split the proceeds, or you can buy out my half. If you believe that I will give you $100,000 for a house that is rightfully mine, you're crazy. So that proves I'm not crazy. I'm not asking for $100,000. You could have done this five years ago. Now the house's equity is closer to $450,000. My half equals $225,000. Consider all of the expensive furniture you just had to have. Let's round that up to an even $250,000. You are insane. I'm not giving you a dime. She screamed as she hung up the telephone. Yes. I laughed when she hung up on me. Yes, my lawyer took a cut, but it was worth it. After the judge ruled in my favor, I waited a few months to see her face again. I even convinced the judge to order her to pay the court fees, as well as my lawyer, for forcing me to take her to court over something that could have been handled outside of court. The House of Prayer prays for more than I estimated based on the value of the furniture. I ended up with $275,000. They ended up buying me out rather than selling. Later, I discovered that it was mostly Clarence's money that they used, which would eventually come back and bite him in the ass. But that is for later. I'd managed to get the house in pretty good shape. I even built a nice-sized shop behind the house. 
I had purchased an old 1972 Chevy pickup that was in bad shape. All I was interested in was the rolling chassis. The rest would be replaced regardless. Over the last year, I slipped it down, cleaned it up, and repainted the entire thing. Once the paint and bodywork were completed, it was time to begin working on the running gear. The rear differential was still in good condition, so I went through it anyway. It had to be capable of handling the power I was about to apply. The transmission was a Borg Warner T10 manual for speed. That was the quick stuff. I decided to have some fun with the engine. This was only going to be a toy, not for daily driving. 427 Big Block. I was able to find one online from the salvage yard. I bought it and had it shipped once it arrived. I placed it on the stand and started pulling it apart. I had to send it to a machine shop to retrieve it. The cylinders, frank and cardboard, new forge crankshaft, 10-1 pistons. Nice. The can is heavy. I had two polished heads installed, followed by double spring valves. Finally, a blower to top it all off. Yeah. I'd probably pass more gas stations than tire shops, but only a few. I chromed the valve covers, polished the aluminum on the blower, and used steel braided hoses. Popping the hood almost necessitated sunglasses. I nearly tricked it the first time I drove it. I was on the freeway and decided to punch you. A big mistake. The back tires came loose, and I barely managed to keep it straight before letting up on the gas. Remember to slowly press down on the accelerator pedal. I drove more cautiously after that. A few weeks later, I saw an advertisement for a car show that was open to the public. I think that would be fun. I completed the form and paid my entry fee. When the day came, I loaded up the 1972 Chevy and drove over to the park. I checked in and was assigned a seat. As I was setting up, I noticed a very nice 1968 GTO parked next to me. I set up my shade structure in my area behind my truck. A couple of chairs and my cooler finished my setup. That's when I noticed the attractive, rigid setting chairs up behind the goat. Yes, I said your deeds, plural. There were two of them. One looked about my age and the other looked to be in her mid to late teens, probably still in high school. There were two significant things that I missed. I didn't see a guy with them and there was nothing on the older woman's left third finger. Of course I looked. Good morning. I like your car, I said pleasantly. They both looked up from what they were doing. Hi. Thanks. I like your truck, too, the older one said. Thanks. Have you been to many of these? This is my first one. I mean, I've been to auto events before, but only as a spectator. This is the first one that I've ever entered anything in. My name is Tom, by the way. Well, this is the third time my daughter and I have been in one. My ex took it to a few prior, though. I'm Mary, and this is my daughter, Jenny. In any case, when you were done, why don't you two come join me in the shade? I have a cooler full of beers, and I could use whatever information about these shows I can obtain. We ended up hanging out much of the day. We would periodically stand up and talk to someone about our cars, but overall it was a pretty enjoyable day. No, I did not win any honors, but I had a good time. I learned that she divorced her spouse three years ago after catching him cheating on her. He was cheating on his boss's wife. She struck a deal with him. She agreed to give him all of the tapes if he signed over the GTO to her. She told me that would greatly hurt him, and she wanted him to keep his work so he could continue to pay his child support and maintenance to her. It was a double victory for her. Besides, his boss was an escort, and she didn't mind if his wife hung the horns on him. Jenny was equally nice and joined in the chat. She told me she was really upset with her father for cheating. She had nothing to do with him anymore. We were having so much fun that I didn't want the show to finish. I volunteered to take them to supper at the Red Lobster a few blocks away. They agreed, and we drove over. I didn't want to be a downer, but they had inquired and told me about their situation. I hit the highlights. I did inform them that my children had taken my wife's side and wanted nothing to do with me anymore. Do you mean she cheated and your children blame you for divorcing her? Jenny was surprised. Yeah. I tried to explain things to them, but she had already turned them against me by that time. Marie placed her hand on my arm. Tom... I am so sorry for you. You seem like a lovely man, and you did not deserve any of it. She spoke truly. I decided to alter the topic to something more cheerful. We ended up talking and laughing for an additional hour. We appear to have a real connection. We swapped phone numbers and appeared willing to meet up with me again. As they were departing, Jenny gave me a big smile, a wink, 
and a double thumbs up. I understood this to mean that she was perfectly fine with meeting up with her mother again. So Mary and I got together again. It was the following weekend. I had called and inquired. She'd gladly agreed. Dinner and dance. I received a kiss on the cheek as I guided her to the door. As I turned to go, I noticed a teen routine in a window, smiling and giving me a double thumbs up. After two more dates, I invited them both back to my house for dinner. Following my divorce, I had honed my culinary skills. Food Network, a couple YouTube videos, and plenty of trial and error. I chose lasagna since I cook it very well. They seemed to enjoy it. They absolutely liked my house. But I overheard Marie tell her daughter that it clearly required a woman's touch. I would not have argued if asked. The following weekend, I was asked to their flat. Marie's food was far superior to my own. Even Kayla couldn't match Marie's performance. I couldn't help it. I understand that it is detrimental to the reader's health, but I couldn't stop eating. I eventually had to apologize to them for taking a picture of myself. They simply laughed and questioned why I was sorry. That was the highest praise you could give to a woman who enjoys cooking. She told me Jenny was nearly as excellent as she was. It was two weeks later that it occurred. I took Marie to supper and then to a dance club. We'd been dancing for a bit when a slow song came on. We were squeezed close and swayed to the music. We had progressed to some really passionate makeout sessions a few weeks prior. She bent down and murmured into my ear, Take me home. Honestly, I was astonished. I thought we were having a wonderful time. But now she wanted to return home. I pulled back to look at her. She must have noticed the grimace on my face and began laughing. You silly men. I meant take me to your house. So happily, I had my ordinary truck and not the 1972. I'm not sure I'd have been able to keep the tires on the road if I had driven the 72 back home. I could be out of practice, but it came back to me very quickly. We ended up repeating it three times before falling asleep. I cooked your breakfast before driving her home. I received another double thumbs up from the two teenagers in the window. A few months later, I inquired and she responded. There was a little ceremony in front of a church. They moved into my house immediately after we married. Jenny even started calling me dad. Life was wonderful. Yes, there were disagreements. Yes, Jenny and I had our issues as well. She was still a teenager, and I was still the authoritative figure. I had to say no on occasion. Nonetheless, she respected me, and her mother loved me as much as I loved her. The unexpected phone call arrived approximately a year later. It was a number I couldn't recognize. Hello, I said as I answered the phone. Hello, Daddy. On the other end of the call, the voice of an eager woman was heard. Curly, your steadfast is me and I have exciting news. Really? It's great to hear from you. It was so nice to hear from her. Perhaps she was reaching out to reconnect. I am getting married. That's wonderful, honey. I'm very delighted for you. Anyway, I want you to attend my wedding. Sweetie, of course. It is one of the greatest honors for a father to accompany his daughter down the aisle. I also created a wedding fund for you. No, Clarence is paying for the wedding and he will also escort me down the aisle. It would be hard for you and mom to sit together, so you would not be in the front row. But I truly want you to be there. Clarence, as in the scumbag your slut of a mother deceived me with. She truly married that sheep, glanced at. I'm trying to reconnect here, and I wanted to reach out and invite you to my wedding. Besides, after you left, she and Clarence began seeing each other more, fell in love, and married. It is actually your fault if you had not abandoned us. She and Clarence would never have continued to see each other. Okay, I see you're still under the assumption that your mother did nothing wrong. I will be unable to attend due to two reasons. First and foremost, I cannot support a marriage that I am certain will fail. You are more likely to cheat on your husband, just as your mother did on me, if he's someone I'd approve of. He'd kick your slutty ass out as soon as he found out. Second, you have taken the last great honor that a father has from me and given it to a dirtbag who knowingly seduced a married woman. That just shows me how shallow and self-centered you've become. Fine, if that is the way you intend to be. Do not expect to ever see your grandchildren, if you raise them in any way similar to you. In any case, I have no desire to associate with them. Seriously, Dad? Mom is correct. You really are the next cook. And after I hung up the phone with my daughter, that was the last I heard from her. So much for the possibility of a relationship with my former daughter. 
I'm very sure there will never be a relationship with Josh, either. Yes, it stung. They still blamed me for what their mother had done. Instead of wallowing in my misery, I just put down my phone and went to the shop. I would forget myself while working on the 1963 Chevy pickup that I had recovered from a field a few months ago. This one would be less radical than my 72. I wanted to be able to drive this one a little longer. I was rebuilding a 350 that was only little beefier than stock. I never saw Jenny creep around the corner and grab my phone. I didn't even notice she was home. Clearly, I was upset with my father. I was trying to reach out to him, and he had the audacity to talk to me like way. It was his fault that our family was split apart. I tried to be courteous and invite him to my wedding, but he just threw everything back at me. I hoped that he would finally accept responsibility for what he had done to our family. I looked down and noticed my phone buzzing. I didn't recognize the phone number, but such calls are common while organizing a wedding. Hello, William. Hi, is it Carly Williams? Yes, can I help you? Yes, you can. You may stop calling my papa a cast iron because he is the best man I have ever met. And he does not deserve to be called a foolish, pampered prostitute by you, reminding him of the pitiful excuses for mankind that you are. I swear you and your family are wasting breathable air in the dark. Are you in? My name is Jenny Williams. I'm your sister. My mother married your prior father, and he adopted me. I love him with all of my heart, and I would never offend or dishonor him. You are an insult to all divers around the world. I'm well aware of what transpired. You slut of a mother went out on a date, fully disregarding her husband and touching another man. The really sad part about it all is that you appear to be fine with it. Let me tell you, my biological father cheated on my mother. She did not hesitate to kick him out. You can also bet your skanky ass that if my mother ever cheated on my father, I would be right there with him, helping him haul her ass out with the rest of the trash. Yes, even though he is not my biological father, he is the most decent, caring, and sensitive person I've ever known. I am considering sending your slut of a mother. Thank you, Card, for being such a giant dumbass and letting go. But if it hadn't been for her ignorance, I wouldn't have him as a parent. You might also inform your grandparents that they have another granddaughter, that I have no desire to be in a relationship with anyone who is so disgusting as to reject their own kid in favor of a cheating slut with backslapping offspring. There is one more thing you can do for me. As you mentioned, your joke vows are to gaze in your husband's eyes and consider what will happen if he decides to cheat on you, when he actually cheats on you. Call me and tell me about it. I'll laugh my ass off with you. Have a miserable life, sis. Click. She hung up. I just gazed at the phone, shocked. First and foremost, I was astonished to learn that my father married. You'd think he'd send his children an invitation. Then upon hearing that I now had a younger sister, an odd thought occurred to me. I couldn't help but think she sounded a lot like me before Mom told Josh and me about Daddy's departure and plans to split up the family over a little issue. I initially assumed that Daddy must have had a very excellent reason for doing so, and I considered moving in with him instead of Mom. Mom then stated how she was feeling and how she only needed this one item to feel better. After all, it was only a little amount of time compared to the length of their relationship. Furthermore, Mom was willing to stick together and work things out. Dad was being stubborn and refused to even try. It was Dad who was going. He was the one who broke them up. I couldn't believe how disrespectful she was to me either. She never gave me the chance to tell her that Dad had left us and that Mom was attempting to move forward. It was as if she didn't care that it was a one-time event. That should not have been a blip on the radar. Given how long they had been together, she had the audacity to call me all of those awful names. She doesn't even recognize me. What was Dad so upset about? Of course, Clarence was going to accompany me down the aisle. After all, he has been there for me throughout the last few years. I haven't spoken to Dad since Josh when I told him how concerned we were about him leaving. Besides, Clarence was paying nearly $20,000 for my wedding. I couldn't comprehend how far the pittance Dad could set aside for my wedding would go. I was still irritated about the phone calls. Half an hour later, Mom and both grandmothers entered. They had gone out shopping. Mom quickly recognized my mood. Honey, what's wrong? I informed Dad about the wedding and requested him to attend. After all, I am his only daughter, and I assumed he would want to attend my wedding. I was hoping that this would be something we could build on and rekindle our relationship. Grandma Williams exclaimed, That is wonderful! 
Will he be there? We haven't heard from him since he called about Thanksgiving a few years back. I exhaled. No, he became irritated when I informed him that Clarence would be escorting me down the aisle and that I believed it would be too awkward for him to sit in the front row with Mom and Clarence. That is really unfortunate. I assumed he'd gotten ahead of himself by this point. As if it wasn't horrible enough, I discovered I have a stepsister approximately five minutes later. What? Sounded like three-part harmony? A few minutes after Dad hung up, I received a call from a girl named Jenny Williams. Apparently, Dad married her mother and adopted her. She wasn't very pleasant on the phone. In fact, the kindest thing she said was that she wanted to thank my mother for being foolish. Otherwise, she wouldn't have such a great father. I described both phone calls to them. They were astonished by Dad and Jenny's vehemence. Tom married, and we were not invited to the wedding. He never informed us about it. I have another granddaughter, Grandma Williams whispered to herself. My wedding day has finally arrived. I quickly considered what I may add or say, and I felt sad that he wouldn't be around on my big day. I had approached him, but he had rejected me. I brushed it off. After all, it was a happy day. I was going to marry the man I actually loved and spend the rest of my life with him. Clarence was beaming as he took my arm and led me up the aisle to the music of the wedding march. I was ecstatic as I embraced all of my friends and relatives. Both sets of my grandparents were present. Josh was one of Bobby's groomsmen. Everyone was present to celebrate my wonderful day. Tears of delight started to gather in my eyes. I looked forward and saw my Bobby smiling at me as he stood in front of the minister. As we passed my mother, I could see her beaming with pride. She, too, had tears of delight rolling down her cheeks. Clarence lifted my veil, kissed my cheek, and murmured, Congratulations, baby. He then handed me over to my soon-to-be husband. I felt a peculiar niggle in my thoughts when the pastor asked, Who gives this bride away? And Clarence replied, Her mother and I do. Something didn't sound right, but I didn't know why. That moment went quickly as the pastor began the ceremony. I looked into the eyes of the love of my life. I was repeating my vow to heaven to hold. In illness and health, during good and terrible times, physical force. And I could not see it. I was staring directly into Bobby's eyes, and I couldn't see anything. What did I suddenly think about? That had been said over the phone. I was staring into my soulmate's eyes when I noticed him with another lady. The picture abruptly changed. I was looking into the lifeless eyes of a broken man as I informed him I had sex with another man. These images were rushing through my thoughts. The words flowed forth without consideration. I understand now. If I thought we had the audience's full attention before, it was nothing compared to now. Bobby looked at me with concern. Suddenly, it felt like the weight had been lifted. I got the largest smile I'd ever had. I finally understand. I replied to Bobby, Do. That's fantastic, Coley. But what do you immediately understand? Absolutely everything, I responded. Then I became serious. Bobby, do you truly love me? Of course I love you. How are you even asking that? I had to ask, since I cannot marry you today. I think I could feel a blast of air pass by me as the entire audience gasped in surprise. We will still get married, just not today. This isn't correct and I have to make things right. I'll get married once and it will be for life, so I need to do it correctly. What's wrong, baby? Bobby, I adore you with everything I've got. I am going to marry you. I will explain everything to you so that you understand entirely, but we need to go and start repairing things. We'll reschedule and have the wedding. You are not leaving me at the altar, are you? Not a chance. In fact, I need you to join me. With that, I turn to the guests. I sincerely apologize, but I simply cannot proceed with this today. We are not canceling our wedding. We're merely postponing it. We will notify you once we have arranged the new date. We understand if you choose not to attend, but consider how you will tell the story of today for years to come. Wouldn't you like to turn up next time to see what happens? Anyway, I'll attempt to make up for some of your displeasure. The reception hall should be prepared. Everything is already paid for with non-refundable deposits, so why not take advantage of them? It's an open bar, so you may eat, drink, dance, and party without stress. Clarence is paying the bill. With that, I grabbed Bobby's hand and started back down the aisle. My mother suddenly blocked my accent, and Clarence stood alongside her. 
He didn't seem thrilled that I'd just flushed over $20,000 down the toilet. I also noted that all of the visitors were now focused on the new confrontation. Those who had stood up to begin their journey to the reception had paused in their tracks to watch the following performance. Clarence began yelling about how much money he had spent and how I was going to repay him in full for the trick I had just pulled. Then came Mom's turn. Carly, what are you doing? Where are you going? She asked. What I am doing is correcting a mistake I committed several years ago. The biggest mistake of my life. I made a mistake by listening to all of your nonsense instead of assisting my father in evicting your slutty ass. The error I made was blaming my father for breaking up the family when it was entirely your responsibility for cheating on him. Carly, I'm your mother. I am not a slut. And you will address me with respect. Really, mother, you are not a slut. A cheater who has cheated before will continue to cheat. Carly, how dare you? How dare I? I'm ashamed that I looked up to you. It wasn't until I looked into Barbie's eyes while reading my vows that I realized what a horrible person you are. A cheater who has cheated before will continue to cheat. As I stared into his eyes, I realized how awful it would be if he ever cheated on me. I knew how much I would hurt the man I love if I cheated on him. I suppose Dad was a good role model for me after all. You certainly would, UHH. What exactly do you mean by that? Mom made a mess. I could detect some terror in her eyes. Seriously, Mom? Do you think I don't know about you? Wednesday afternoon workouts with your personal trainer, Jim Davis? How they always occur at his place rather than at the gym. It's funny how you only go to the gym to see him. Carlos, how long does it take? You get an extra hour every two weeks because he cleans the pool while you are sitting on a chaise lounge. How about you? Every time the landscape crew finishes their yard work, they get gangbanged. I have some nice videos of that from when I came home early a couple of times, just in case you try it tonight. And don't forget that you always tip. After each hair appointment, see Mario, your hairstylist in the back room blue shop. At least Clarence is your boss at work, so he doesn't have to worry about you cheating on him with your boss or me leaving anyone out. Yeah, I nearly forgot about Alan Morse, your neighbor. He's been coming over whenever his wife has a girls' night out for the past three years. I approached Clarence after I finished tearing her dirty laundry. Perhaps she hoped that he hadn't heard anything, despite the fact that I said it loudly enough to be heard throughout the church. He was standing less than two feet away. Clarence had a shocked expression on his face. I had an evil thought. When I looked at Clarence O and Clarence in front of God and all these witnesses, I vowed with the same commitment that my mother did when she made her wedding vows. I will repay you for the money you spent on this wedding. We all know how she keeps her vows, so you can count on me to keep mine as well. Yeah. He shouldn't hold his breath while waiting for a dog, seeing that Mom was distracted. I pulled Bobby down the aisle. I made a quick stop to speak with the videographer. Yes, he captured the entire event on camera. He smiled broadly as he handed me a copy of the video. He was programmed to create a duplicate copy in case something happened to the original. I quickly scribbled my signature on the release form, allowing him to post on YouTube. I was hoping it would go viral and benefit my mother. Seeing Bobby, I dashed out to the parking lot. He had driven his car here, and our belongings were in the trunk. We were going to switch them to the limo before leaving the reception. His brother was planning to drive it back to his apartment after the reception. As I slid into the passenger seat, I smiled, knowing how much Daddy would like Bobby. Where are we going? he inquired as we drove out of the parking lot. Go west on 156. I'll look for the address and enter it in the ways I answered when I first started using my phone. It was not difficult. He wasn't actually trying to hide. After all, I knew the town where he lived, and a search of property records provided the information I needed. It was approximately two hours away. Now I just hope he was home when we arrived. We did not begin to change. I was on a mission and did not want to waste time. Tom, it's unusual to open your front door and find a woman in a wedding gown and a man in a tuxedo standing on your porch. I mean, if you were a minister and lived at the church, it would happen on occasion. The problem was that I wasn't a minister and didn't live in a church. Even more surprising, I recognized one of them. I didn't know who the man was, but that was certain. Chief, my oldest daughter is standing there. My oldest daughter made it abundantly clear that she did not want to see me again. I seem to recall that today was her wedding day, but I couldn't understand why she was here. She should either be attending the church reception or on her way to her honeymoon. 
Standing on my doorstep was the last place she should have gone. Can I talk to you for a minute, Daddy? She asked quietly, still stunned. I stepped back and allowed them to enter. I point to the living room where Mary and Jenny were sitting. I could clearly see the shock on their faces. This is my wife Mary with our daughter Jenny, Jenny. Mary, this is Callie. I'm sorry, but I'm not sure who the guy with her is. Yes, Daddy, this is my fiancé, Bobby Jensen. Bobby, this is my father, Tom Williams, with his wife Mary and my sister Jenny. Carla introduced the fiancé. I assumed he would be your husband by now. Didn't you get married a few hours ago? I was perplexed. That is what I need to talk to you about. I couldn't do it today. I can't get married unless my dad walks me down the aisle. Dad, I finally understand. You were correct. You were always correct. I apologize for getting caught up in mom's bullshit and blaming you. It was mom who threw everything away. Not that you're abandoning us. I apologize for everything I said and did. You did not deserve any of that. I'd make any excuse for my behavior because there really isn't one other than being young, foolish, and listening to the wrong people. I just hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me and accept me back into your life. I really want to marry Bobby. He's a great guy, and I know you'll like him. I can't marry him unless you promise to walk me down the aisle and give me away. Well, this was totally unexpected. I probably should have focused on other things but there appeared to be an elephant or two in the room. Even though I was relieved that my daughter had decided not to abandon me, the man wanted me back in her life. My overriding curiosity about the scene before me demanded my attention. So clearly you did something at the wedding? I mean, you were wearing your bridal gown and Bobby was dressed in a tux. So I'm assuming you were present at the wedding. She looked down at herself, then at her fiancé. Yes. We were halfway through the ceremony when I had an insight. She spoke as she handed me a CD. Maybe you should watch as Bobby and I change into our regular clothing. Bobby dashed out to the car and grabbed a suitcase. Marie led Carly to a bedroom where they could change him. As soon as Carly and Bobby had settled down, I set up the video player and connected it to the huge screen in the living room. Mary returned and sat beside me as I pressed play on the remote. It began as a conventional wedding ceremony. The groomsmen led the bridesmaids down the aisle and then separated at the altar. Bobby entered with the minister and their then flower girl. Finally, Clarence escorted Carly to the altar. It was all pretty normal until Carly started reading her vows. Even pointing was common. Suddenly, she appeared to be having difficulty speaking. It appeared that she was caught on a single word. She did it. I can't believe she did it and it hit her so hard, Jenny whispered to herself. I was about to ask her what she was talking about when Carly stopped trying to say her vows and shifted the situation. We watched the footage as she stopped the wedding and faced her mother. I was surprised to be revelations. Apparently, her adultery increased after she married Clarence. Carly and Bobby had changed and returned to their living room. By the time the video concluded, I simply couldn't go through with it. I looked into Bobby's eyes and realized how upset he'd be if I did to him what mom had done to you. I now realized what it meant to forsake all others, and Mom broke that commitment. That's when I realized how much she had dishonored you, and how much I was dishonoring you by marrying you without putting you in your rightful place of honor. How can I make those sacred vows in a ceremony when the two most disrespectful persons I know are in positions of honor? How can this sale have any real significance if the most vulnerable person I know is not involved? I understood that if I truly needed those vows, it would have to be my father, the guy who taught me morals and ethics, who walks me down the aisle and gives me where I am now. I determined that when I marry Bobby, it should be you, not Mom and Clarence. Carly paused for a moment, then smiled and looked over to Jenny. Besides, I need my younger sister to be one of my bridesmaids. You kicking my ass woke me up. I remembered what you said to me as I tried to recite my vows while looking into Bobby's eyes. How can I get married if you aren't sticking up for me? There was a lot to take in. We spoke for seven more hours. I had no idea Jenny had received Carly's phone number from my phone. I went out to my workshop shortly after Carly contacted me that day. She walked into her room and called Carly on her personal phone a few minutes later. It got late, so I made them spend the night in the guest bedroom. Carly received a few phone calls throughout the evening. She ignored Clarence and Kayla's calls, but a few of her pals called as well. It appeared that several of the attendees accepted her offer to party on Clarence's pay. 
He attempted to cancel, but it was too late for him to receive a refund by the time he arrived at the reception venue. There were already a few dozen people making use of the open bar. The food had already been prepared, and all of the servers, bartenders, and DJs were present and working. Clarence eventually gave up, bought a drink, and went to a table in the corner to drown his sorrows. Josh gave her a video he took with his phone as his mother went over to try to talk to Clarence. It didn't seem to go very well. Clarence yelled a much. The phrase cheating slut dominated the debate. It appeared that their relationship was also coming to an end. Josh stated that he was able to cancel the airline and resort bookings, but he was charged a 20% cancellation fee for the late cancellation because Carly and Bobby had already taken time off work for their honeymoon. They stayed with us for the whole week. I got to reconnect with the daughter I thought I had lost. I also got to know Bobby. He's a nice guy with high moral standards. It was strange at first because all he knew about me were lies supplied to him by my ex-wife. Son and daughter will not completely lie, but they will embellish the reality to present me as the bad man for abandoning my family. A few essential facts were also left out of those exchanges. After the truth began to emerge, when I showed him my shopping and recent projects, he approached me and asked for aid. Even though he preferred classical concepts, we both admired each other's vehicles. Hey, we're both gearheads. At least he wasn't one of those sluggish men who drove an automatic. His challenger had a manual transmission around halfway through the week. A new wedding date was set. It was going to be held at the same location on the same weekend a year later. This time I'd pay for it and lead her down the aisle. Mary was also conscripted to help with the wedding. Yes, Jenny planned to be a bridesmaid as well. Carly and Bobby called everyone in the wedding party to give them an update. Everyone but Kayla and Clarence over the next few months. Carly and I worked hard to reestablish our friendship. Bobby and I got to know each other better. We attended a few auto events and watched movies. GTO, my 1972 truck, Bobby's Challenger, and I even had Jenny enter a 1974 Firebird that I purchased for her. Carly and Bobby would come over and spend a couple of days with us every month. Josh even appeared a few times. It was harder with him because he was always closer to his mother than I was, but we were able to rebuild some of our bond. I believe he did it more for Carly than me, but I'll take it. Besides, he always had some news from home. Speaking of Kayla and Clarence, things weren't going so well. Clarence had moved out and filed for divorce. The good news for Kayla was that Clarence filed on irreconcilable differences rather than adultery. This meant that the prenup's heavy penalties would not be implemented. He filed that manner to get it done quickly and without a struggle. The good news for Clarence was that he had a prenup. The prenuptial agreement stated that all of his assets prior to marriage were excluded. Kayla would receive half of the assets built during the wedding, which was not much when the assets from before the marriage were factored out. She would effectively get to keep the property and receive approximately $50,000 for it. Clarence attempted to obtain a piece of it, but he lacked evidence to support his claim. Sure, his money was used to purchase my share after my divorce, but there was no solid proof of it. Apparently, he obtained the funds through a business loan for his company, but he never documented what he did with the money. They also never changed the title of the house to include his name because it was Kayla's before they married. She refused to address it. Clarence ended up repaying the debt with nothing to show for it. By the time he learned he wouldn't be getting his money back from the house, it was too late to refile with Delta. Kelly's reputation in the community fell significantly as word of her romance spread, Four of her friends began to ignore her, and she stopped receiving invites to parties, charity activities, and other gatherings. Even worse for her, because she did not work and relied on Clarence's money, her financial situation deteriorated dramatically. Clarence learned an expensive lesson. He was out a few hundred thousand dollars for buying out my portion of the house. He was out an additional $28,000 since the wedding went apart. In addition, he had to pay $50,000 to Hill during the divorce proceedings. The humiliated killer was also upset that her affairs had been made public and that Clarence was divorcing her in such a manner. She started telling her surviving pals that she cheated on him because he had such a small item and didn't know how to utilize it correctly. She also informed all her girlfriends that he refused to drink despite his insistence that she suck him off. That type of talk spreads like wildfire. It wasn't long before every woman he attempted to approach in the bar laughed at him. 
He became a loner, only going to work and then home. His social life disappeared. Seriously, Daddy? My eldest daughter requested. No parent is ever truly prepared to let go of his daughters. But I wanted to do something for you. I responded. As the doors opened, music began to fill the cathedral. I went forward, starting with my left foot, and proudly led my daughter down the aisle. I gave a short peek and my smile widened. My ex-wife was seated in the fourth row behind my wife. Mary was in the first row, taking her place of honor. I would join her when I had cared for my last crucial daughter, the one who gave this woman permission to marry her father. I grant her consent to marry. I spoke aloud. I love you, Munchkin. I said to her as I kissed her on the cheek and handed her over to Bobby. Yes. I forgot to mention my wife. No, this was not entirely my idea. Carly asked me to do it that way. I then turned, walked over, and sat next my wife to have and hold, in sickness and health. Throughout good and terrible times, seek all others. Carly virtually yelled out the last part, followed by a dazzling smile. She completed her vows. The ceremony was amazing. Cheers erupted as they kissed at the end. I peered down from the head table. Mary was immediately beside me. I noticed Kayla sitting at a table off to the side. She didn't seem happy. Every time she awoke, she sat in her usual location. She scowled. I didn't realize she was taking advantage of the open bar. Clarence hadn't been invited. I am not sure if he would have arrived, even if he had been. My last major milestone for my daughter was completed. I'd accompanied her down the aisle, given her permission to marry, and delivered a lovely toast to the newlywed couple. Danced with my daughter to the father-daughter dance, then with my wife as my daughter, her husband, and his parents danced to the second song. My obligations were complete. I was sitting at the table with my wife. My younger daughter was out dancing with one of the group of boys vying for her attention. Pardon me, Mary. Can I borrow your hubby for the dance? I heard a familiar voice behind me. Request from my wife, Mary. And I turned around to face my ex-wife, Mary, for a brief moment before responding. Just make sure you return him to the location you found him. She stared at me. I trust you. I don't trust her. Don't try anything stupid. I let Kayla out on the floor. They started playing a slow song. It wouldn't surprise me if she ordered it just for this purpose. I was careful not to draw her in too close. We danced for a while before she started speaking. You were instructed to give it one night. We should have moved on from that and continued as usual. This was meant to be just the two of us today, and you were not supposed to be out that night. You should have known better than to believe that I would have been fine with you cheating on me, no matter how often you did it. I did not cheat. I informed you about it before I did. I did not sneak behind your back. Whether you told me or not is irrelevant. You had sex with someone else, which is considered cheating. Besides, I never granted you permission. I warned you not to do it, but you did anyway. I never wanted this. I only wanted that one night. Then we could have stayed together forever. You understand that you are the only man I have ever loved. There was no love for him. Aside from that, the sex wasn't really good. He was selfish. And he was not even as large as you. So why did you marry him? You divorced me. Sure, I did not love him. But I enjoy looking after you after you've left. I did not want to be alone. I hoped I'd learn to adore him. But I couldn't get over you. I did all that trash to you because you abandoned me. I still adore you but you wouldn't speak to me after that one night. I realized you were everything I ever needed, and I would never go out with another man again. So, why did you cheat on him? He was beginning to suck. I thought I could train him, but he disregarded my advice. He refused to back down on me. I stopped giving him blowjobs. He would simply stick it in, pump for a few minutes, then roll over and fall asleep. When I couldn't take it anymore... I discovered a few of other guys who could truly give me an orgasm. I had no notion Carly knew anything about it, even if I was aware of it. I would never have expected her to throw me under the bus like that. I feel sad for you. We had a beautiful marriage, but you tossed it away for a single night of poor sex. I don't think there's any chance. I couldn't stop giggling. Not just... No, but hell no. To begin with, even if I weren't married now... What you did by poisoning my children against me destroyed any chance of us ever reconciling. Now I'm married again to a woman I adore. I also adore my other daughter. The best I can provide is decency. 
when we are in the same location and attend activities with our children and grandchildren. Fortunately, the song ended shortly thereafter. I did not speak to her again that night. She couldn't afford the mortgage payments on her house, so she sold it and moved to a modest apartment. She took out enough money from the house to live on if she was careful. She did go out with her friends on occasion, but she never had another relationship that I am aware of. Clarence ended up living alone as well. Carly and Bobby shared a long and loving marriage. They had three children, two boys and one girl. Josh subsequently married a nice girl as well. They have two daughters. As far as I know, neither one has cheated on the other. There are people who say I should have sought vengeance after killing Clarence. The truth is that there was nothing I could do to injure them without going to jail or having it backfire on me. I resolved to just go on and enjoy my life as best I could. There's a saying that the best retribution is a life well lived. I accomplished that, and karma took care of the rest. Crime is a witch, and your stripper's name is Vengeance. Clarence and the killer were not burned, but they did not escape unharmed. No, I had nothing to do with it. But I still feel good about myself. I now have my wife, daughter, and two of their children back in my life. I am surrounded by individuals who adore me. I live a good life. Ready, Daddy? My daughter inquired. No parent is ever truly prepared to let go of his daughters. But I wanted to do something for you. I responded. As the doors opened, music began to fill the cathedral. I said, starting with my left foot and proudly leading my daughter down the aisle. My wife was in the first row, taking her seat of honor and smiling broadly. I would join her when I completed my final crucial task for my daughter. Do not worry, Daddy. I'm going through with it today. I spoke with Carly, and I'm doing it correctly the first time. They assured me, this concludes our story. Thank you for taking time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this article, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to relate about yourself or someone else's predicament, please contact me. Take care.